uh, we should maybe start getting on towards five past ten. Um, so um, hopefully uh, you can hear me all right, Alan. Uh, you already confirmed that you can and that you can see the, the presentation okay. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. This is, uh, I think, the fourth in our series of uh, webinars that we've been running throughout the year. Um, and today's topic is the importance of sediment in water quality in Ireland's inland water bodies. Um, and it will be presented by my colleagues, Heather Webb and Helen Canwell. Um, if you just move to the next slide, Heather. Yeah, so that, this, uh, that's us. So uh, I'm uh, chairing the session uh, this morning. My name's Elliot Taylor. I'm the Divisional Director for APEM's office in Ireland. Uh, so we opened our office here in September last year. Um, we're now up to a contingency of five people, including freshwater ecologists, but we also work very closely with our colleagues in the UK, such as Heather and Helen, on water quality and many other issues. Um, and you may have seen the news that we've also just joined forces um, with Woodrow Sustainable Solutions based up in Sligo. So we now have uh, a presence in the south uh, down here in Cork, where I'm based, and also up in the north in, in Sligo, uh, where Woodrow are. Um, so Heather and Helen, do you want to introduce yourselves? Heather, do you want to go first? Yeah, so morning, everyone. So my name is Heather Webb. I'm an associate director at APEM and I run the water quality team. Uh, I've been with APEM 15 years now. Um, so a bit of an old timer, shall we say. And Helen? Yeah, hi you guys. Uh, my name is Helen Cantwell. I'm um, a senior consultant at APEM. I joined three weeks ago. Um, so I'm still learning the APEM way of working and uh, it's a great learning curve to be honest and so it's a great great team to work with so i'm looking forward to our discussions today good Thank stuff you. so heather if you just want to flip on to the next slide yeah so we want to we want to focus on the on the technical content today that's what this webinar is about um but just uh, to give you a brief overview of uh, of apem if you've not uh, been on one of these webinars before um, we're a, a, yeah, a global consulting firm. We, we work in Ireland, we work in the UK, across uh, all of the, the countries in the UK. Uh, we have office in uh, Germany and Australia. We're also working in the US and are talking to people that working much more broadly as well. Um, and we cover uh, really from source to sea. Um, so we cover all aspects of, of water, freshwater and marine. Um, we are working in renewable energy, largely in offshore wind. Um, we do a lot of work on marines and marinas and ports. Uh, for example, we're looking at a lot of uh, port development and dredging uh, around the coast of Ireland at the moment. We have one of the biggest bio labs uh, of any consulting firm, uh, certainly in Europe, where we cover um, all things biological except microbiology. Um, so macroinvertebrates, phytoplankton, zooplankton, ichthyoplankton, both marine and freshwater. Um, and we work in sectors of construction, transport, power and utilities and cover uh, environmental aspects of all of those things. Heather, can you just... Yeah, so uh, we now have our office, uh, as you can see, number 10 down there in, in Cork, as well as all those offices across uh, Wales, Scotland uh, and England. Uh, and as I said, we've just um, acquired Woodrow Sustainable Solutions who are based up in Sligo, uh, in the north of the Republic of Ireland. Um, yeah, so we hope we will be able to, uh, to meet your, your needs through our offices and our staff, wherever you might have them. But over to the technical content, that's what this is all about. Um, so I'll hand over to Heather and uh, Helen. I think Heather's gonna go first and then hand over to Helen. Um, if you do have any questions or comments, please can you use the Q&A function, um, which you'll find if you move your mouse, it will pop up at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's towards the left-hand side of the middle uh, between participants and polls, at least on, on my screen. So if you can just pop any questions in there, just pop them in um, as they come along. I'll either answer them um, if I can as we go, uh, or we'll have a bit of a Q&A session uh, at the end and we hope to finish around 11 o'clock 
uh, with the presentation and then with some questions and answers. So uh, enough from me, over to you, Heather and Helen, thanks. Thanks, Aria. Um, so as I my name is Heather. Um, I've got a broad background in aquatic ecology. Um, my um, back, uh, academic background was on marine uh, and then later moving into more general aquatic. But I've got a particular interest in the evaluation of water quality parameters, so chemical, my, microbiological and ecological, and their interpretation against current environmental standards. So the water quality team at APEM, we've uh, been responsible for the development and implementation of monitoring programmes um, across the UK and in Ireland. And these have involved monitoring and management of water quality at the site and implementation of necessary improvements to maintain their overall quality, maintain or improve their overall quality. And a key part of this work is um, consideration and management of sediment quality. Um, so this is the focus of my talk today. Uh, I'll run through some of the work my team does with regards to sediment. So the development of nutrient budgets, nutrient release experiments and sediment oxygen demand surveys. I'll then hand over to my colleague Helen to talk us through some of the work she's recently completed as part of her PhD, again linking to sediment. So as Elliot says, there'll be time at the end for any questions. Um, if you want a separate discussion with myself, Elliot or Helen, then let us know and we can give you a separate call outside of this. Okay, so more than a quarter of lakes in Ireland are failing to meet environmental quality standards due to high levels of nitrates and phosphates within the sources primarily being agriculture and wastewater discharges. And the quality of lake sediments can significantly impact the conditions of water bodies, resulting in a deterioration in quality under certain conditions. So a large proportion of the nutrient input into lakes eventually becomes incorporated into the sediment. So this is including uh, dead algal cells, which then sink to the bed. And while much of this nutrient load is permanently removed from the water, um, so the sediment acts as a sink, um, the sediment itself can also act as a reservoir from which under certain circumstances nutrients can be released back into the water. In particular, during uh, low oxygen events, so when there's um, anoxic bottom waters, um, this facilitates the release of phosphorus from the sediment into the overlaying water. So therefore, an understanding of sediment nutrient concentrations is really important in devising management actions to reduce nutrient levels in water bodies. It's often not enough to just look at what's in the water itself and what's coming in from the inflows. The sediment can be a very important source, which is often forgotten. So we've done uh, a number of sediment quality investigations, developed nutrient budgets for a range of sites, um, and reviewed a number of management and restoration options for still water and wetland sites. This has involved sediment sampling um, to identify key nutrient inputs. Uh, and we've worked on a range of sites from um, small ornamental ponds through to large drinking water reservoirs. So, as I say, the sediments uh, are a natural sink for nutrients, um, but also, under certain conditions, a source. And that's the process referred to as internal loading. Um, and that internal loading, if not managed, can result in um, deterioration of water quality, regardless of what you do in the catchment or in the reservoir it's or lake itself. So, first element we do is nutrient budgets. So, to manage nutrient concentrations effectively, you need to develop a nutrient budget. So, you need to understand where all your nutrients are coming from. 
And this budget identifies the sources of nutrients to the system and the relative contribution of each source to the so total load. Source apportionment um, then evaluates the contributions of different sources to the total load, considering the following factors. So you've got your external load from direct surface inflows. The internal load, which is from the sediments, if applicable, uh, you may have loads from groundwater. We're currently working on um, a fishing, very small fishing pond, which has got a very high concentration of nitrate coming from a groundwater source. You've also got to consider the load from the atmosphere, uh, including rain. And finally, the load from the bird populations. The atmosphere and the bird um, are often forgotten when considering uh, nutrient sources. And only once you've understood the sources of your nutrient system can you effectively manage this. The birds is an interesting one um, because it can play a significant role in adding nutrients to the system. We've got um, just down here a table um, of some of the literature of some of the loads of total phosphorus and nitrogen um, per bird per day. So in developing a nutrient budget, if you have data on the, the species and numbers of birds using that system, you can then estimate what the load might be from that population. With regards to the atmosphere, um, so we have done direct measurement of this before um, from rainfall traps and monitoring systems. Um, Based on a review of the literature, the phosphorus content of rain is generally low, so less than 30 micrograms phosphorus in unpolluted regions, but can be over 100 micrograms of total phosphorus in urban and heavily industrialized areas. In rain, you can get between 0 0.01 and 0 0.65 grams per square meter per year. And there's two ways of estimating a nutrient budget. Um, from real time, in-field measurements of each of these things. So with regards to surface inflows, you would measure nutrient concentrations and flows in the stream to determine a load. But then you can also apply export coefficients from a range of literature on this subject. And in many instances, the nutrient load is developed by a combination of the two, depending on the project, the project outcome, and of course, the project budget. But the overall aim of a nutrient budget is to determine what are your significant sources, and hence, where is the best place to target management actions. A key example um, of this is uh, there, there is no point tackling a catchment issue if the sediment is the major contributor to the nutrient load within your lake. Um, <clears throat> this is because if it's the most significant, whilst you're reducing the catchment inputs, the sediment will still remain as a source. And you can do things in that situation. Um, you've got, you can look at sediment dredging, sediment capping to remove that input. So we've just got an example here of a nutrient budget uh, for, for one of the sites um, that we've worked on. As you can see here, um, the water file 25%, so not an inconsequential amount of nutrients from the birds and 8% from rainfall. And then these are the inflows into this system. And so you can see from here that we've identified the, the main inflow and there are works being done on that inflow to reduce the load from that.
We will also, as part of any work on sediments, look at sediment quality. Uh, so we'll collect samples and look at a range of, of nutrients in the sediment. Um, and Helen will, will talk more about this later on. Um, but there is a threshold value in the literature of 1,000 milligrams per kilogram uh, total phosphorus. And above that, um, it's more than likely that phosphorus will be released into the water column during certain circumstances. So on to the second element then, the nutrient release experiment. So the release of phosphorus from the sediments is a complex process. Um, it's often enhanced by low oxygen concentrations, as I mentioned at the start. Um, under oxygenated conditions, the release of phosphorus is generally suppressed. But under low oxygen concentrations, which are most prevalent during the summer, the process of stratification can lead to bottom water anoxia, and that allows nutrients to be released from the sediment. Now, in view of this, um, we've done a number of nutrient release experiments whereby we aim to quantify the potential for sediments to release phosphorus into the water column. We do this by collecting two sediment samples per site and a sample of the overlaying water. We then transfer those into laboratory conditions, so replicating the sediment with overlaying water into tubs within the laboratory environment. We collect water samples from the bottom waters at each site in the field, which acts as a baseline. We then subject the cores to oxic or anoxic treatment over the course of eight days. So you've got your two replicates, one will be oxic, one will be anoxic. And we do that through the use of nitrogen gas. The use of nitrogen means that we can't do this experiment for nitrogen because obviously we're adding nitrogen. So um, the data will, will be incorrect for that. But also nitrogen doesn't tend to come out of the sediment in the same way as phosphorus does. So over eight days, um, we continue the treatment and at the end, we take a sample and determine the increase or sometimes decrease in concentrations in the water following the various treatments. And here we've got some of the latest results from one of our sites in the Northwest. And you can see here, um, much larger increase in orthophosphate um, in the anoxic treatments at all sites, except site seven. We then can multiply this up. So we get, a, um, we get an amount of phosphorus potentially able to be released from the sediment under anoxic conditions. If you then got bathymetry data um, and you've got oxygen data, you can work out a total load per year based on the sediment. So you're looking at how much sediment is in the system, how much of it is in a water depth which would go anoxic during the summer, and you can multiply that up and feed it into your nutrient budget. And where the sediment has been a source of significant nutrients to a system, um, we've reviewed a range of management options for this from dredging through to sediment capping um, where you there's a, a product called Foslock we've used a few times where you cap the sediment and it keeps all the nutrients in the sediment. And the final thing for me then is to talk about the sediment oxygen demand. So we've, we've talked about determining how much uh, nutrients come from the sediment. Now moving on to something slightly different, um, but still important when considering new sediment in your lake. The sediment oxygen demand is the oxygen demand of the sediment. 
So the interactions between the sediment and the water play an important role in determining overall water quality. Um, and one of the uh, biggest impacts on the overlaying water is the potential for the sediment to strip oxygen out of the water column. So that's what sod is. Um, it may therefore have an extremely important influence on water quality of standing water bodies. It can promote um, bottom water anoxia. And as we said, bottom water anoxia can trigger the release of nutrients and other elements from the sediment. I say other elements there, we've um, measured iron and manganese coming out of the sediments during periods of bottom water anoxia, in particular affecting drinking water supplies. So an understanding of sod um, is therefore very important when looking at the sediment as a whole and also when considering nutrients. APEM's first experience of this is more to do with designing aeration and destratification systems, but it's still very important when you come to look at sediment quality. So back in the 80s, uh, we developed a dedicated chamber to take sod measurements in situ. Um, previously, it's all been done in the lab, but we did some lab trials of lab versus in situ. And as you can see from the results on the bottom of the screen here, there's, there's quite a difference. And what this chamber does, uh, you lower it to the bottom of the water. It creates a seal on the sediment. There is a water quality monitoring probe in the top of the chamber, and you measure the decrease in oxygen over the period of an hour. The sod value is then derived using the relationship between the oxygen reduction rate across that hour, a temperature conversion factor to 20 degrees, the volume of the sod chamber, and the surface area of the sediment that the sod chamber occupies. The temperature conversion factor is an important thing to say here, because it means that you can do sod surveys at any time of year, because it corrects it to 20 degrees. There is also within the calculation for sod, you can factor in the BOD, the biological oxygen demand of the water. If it's particularly high in your system, you can factor that into the equation. As I say, we've used this a lot to design aeration and destratification systems. Um, but it's also useful if it's particularly high, it can exacerbate stratification, bottom water anoxia, and uh, hence nutrients being released into the system. Okay, I will pass on to Helen now, if that's all right, Helen. Hi, Helen, yeah, that's fine, thanks very much. Hi guys, uh, my name is Helen Cantwell, and I um, uh, my background is typically a uh, reservoir, uh, which reservoirs which feed treatment works and how they respond to climate change with regards to drought conditions, variations in active pumping regimes, uh, frequencies, rainfall events um, and the like. Uh, so this is what I'm going to talk about today, which is the dynamic sediment. And I use the word carefully, they're dynamic, not just the sediment, because I need to express how important it is. How, how, try again, how important it is to remember that the, the sediment is never still. If you take a sediment sample today, you can't take that sediment sample um, as representing the reservoir for the next week, two weeks, year, or even, even till tomorrow, potentially. Um, because conditions within the sediment are constantly changing. So essentially, the samples that you actually take today are nothing more than a snapshot in time. And you want to be able to understand how the sediment is contributing to the water quality of the lake or the reservoir, then it's something that is um, going to be needed. It's going to be an ongoing process. It's not a one-off sample. Similarly, it's important to take samples at various locations within, uh, within the reservoir of the, of the lake, as one sample at one designated uh, location within the reservoir of the lake will not be sufficient because it would simply represent that particular area. Sediment composition concentrations and also then ratios uh, will also change. 
Uh, usually, we have influences such as uh, weather conditions. We can have an increased uh, uh, frequency of rain, or we can have a reduced frequency, uh, but a heavier volume of rain. Now, this can actually uh, destabilize any sediment bank that may be exposed, for example, during drought conditions during the summertime, and wash this unstable sediment from the banking into the reservoir. We could have sediment disturbance, such as uh, by uh, the wind, for example. So if you have a shallow area of water, then the wind can come along, it can disturb the water, and it can have an effect on the sediment below. The seasons, of course, we can have a drought in the summer, heavier rain and wind during the, during the winter, although this may be changing somewhat uh, as, as a consequence of climate change, depending on, on, the, on the area and location and how long we're looking into the future. There are inflow patterns, which are directly affected by the weather, so if we are in drought condition, you're likely to have less of an inflow or less inflow points into a lake or a reservoir. So this as well affects the sediment dynamics around those locations where they're more likely to be uh, less disturbed if the inflow stops and more likely to be disturbed during areas where you have um, uh, higher rates of inflow because of heavy rain. Abstraction patterns. So, for example, if we have uh, a reservoir which is fed by a river, but it's not naturally filled up with the river, if it's abstracted from the river point and then pumped underground to the reservoir, then the inflow section there of the um, of the abstracted water that can create create its own path. But when you abstract and then you stop and then you have a drought, and then you restart the abstraction process, that is going to have a, a, a direct effect upon the, uh, the sediment layout. We have water activities. Some reservoirs and lakes are open to wind sports, um, swimming, open swimming, and the likes, and boats. And then we have the invasive species, for example, uh, the zebra mussels, which is what I've mentioned here. Um, zebra mussels tend to dominate the periphery of a reservoir or a lake, and they have a direct effect upon the localised sediment around the periphery. And that becomes more of an issue um, when we have a drought condition, so the, re the level of the reservoir or the lake decreases and it exposes these organisms, it exposes the mussels, and then they desiccate. But once the levels of the water rise again, all of the consequences of their presence, such as an accumulation of um, the feces, the organisms within the, the pseudo feces, and then you have the phosphorus accumulated around that particular periphery, will all get washed back into the water. So I'd will Chris Whitty, as we said, Heather, could I have a next slide, please? Thank you. Um, sediment redistribution. Now, we can have sediments within the reservoir, which can be there for a very, very long time, but it doesn't mean that it stays in the one area. Um, an example I have here, which I've already mentioned, is uh, wind and wave action. Now, you could have a lot of sediments within the, the deep areas of a lake or a reservoir and also in the shallow areas, but the ones in the shallow area are more likely um, to be uh, resuspended and redistributed as a consequence of changes in water depth and uh, wave action and the, and, and the rain that we have. The inflow route uh, er erosion is actually quite an important one. I've, I've included a photograph here, I, I hope it's quite clear to you. This photo here, I'll, um, if I can just have the arrow here, in the distance, I don't know if you can see, there's um, uh, a, an edge to the bank in it, right in the distance, right on the horizon, there's a green edge. Now that is the typical edge of the reservoir where this photograph was taken. Now that usually the water is high enough to meet the furthest edge that you can see just on the tree line in the distance. This photograph was taken during a drought conditions at the time. That's it, thank you, Heather, at, uh, at, uh, at one of the reservoirs. And as the water level decreased, it, it exposed the inflow route from the pumped abstraction in the supplying river. Now, there's one inlet only to this reservoir from the particular river. And when the water's high, the damage to the banking is not visible. It's not very clear because it's hidden. But when the water levels decrease, the banking has become exposed. And it shows the amount of damage caused by the, uh, the water inflow directly. Now, the inflow, there was no cambium there. It was all one level ground. But the disturbance caused by the inflow water, the speed, um, the frequency, the volume, it has stripped back the banking and it's continuing to do so um, on a daily basis. This will also uh, respond to uh, any stops in, in abstraction because 
during time of, when it stopped during drought conditions. As you can see in this photograph, the banking has become more destabilized because it's allowed to dry out, it's desiccating. So they're still pumping, but this desiccated sediment then is liable to fall into the uh, into the inflow or be washed away during periods of heavy inflow or heavy rainfall into the rain into the inflow canal and that then will be carried into the reservoir further uh, um, mixing up the sediment as it goes. We have benthic fish and burrowing organisms. Now benthic fish tend to uh, disturb the sediment uh, through uh, just feeding and swimming quite closely and some of them are breeding at the very bottom of, of, the, of the sediment. And of course burrowing organisms as well are a very big uh, part of sediment redistribution at the, at the bottom of reservoirs and lakes. We also have landslides. Now, a landslide could be applied, such as in this photograph here, uh, where we can see some of the banking is falling away, uh, but it can also occur beneath the water level, which we are not familiar with. So, for example, if that water level was high, as it was during the rain season or during the winter time, then the volume of the inflow may have already resulted in some of that sediment being stripped away, but in large chunks where it, actually, where it falls into, in, in the, into the canal, uh, just like a landslide. And that, of course, then over time is also stripped away and carried through into the reservoir. The illustration on the right hand side um, represents um, iron bound with phosphorus uh, concentrations in the top sediment layer at four uh, transect at uh, four points along the transects within this particular reservoir. The layer itself was between zero and three centimeters thick, and we have site one, two, three, and four. Thank you, Heather. Here we have different years. So the first column for each square represents April 2016. Next, to that we have July 2017. Then we have April 2018 and July 2018. So we can see here how much the sediment has changed over that space of time. Now, ideally, we should have actually done some sampling closer together. And that would also better illustrate how much the sediment composition changes over that time. Could you have the next slide, please, Heather? Thank you. The sediment depth. So sediment composition will vary with depth. It's not just going to vary at the, at the, at the, at the utmost surface in the top zero to three centimetres. It'll actually, um, it'll be, depending on the location, of course, of the sediment, it can be disturbed in the shallow, not so much in the deep, etc., etc. So the depth of the sediment is also liable to change over the time as well. So the surface composition can indicate a risk of salvabacterial bloom, historic deposition of nutrients and metals, um, historic benthic, benthic primary activity and autochthonous versus alloxonous sources of nutrients. So, for example, we have a graph on the right hand side here for total organic carbon. Now, this was actually taken at the same reservoir again. Site one was at the, uh, at the southern side of the site, which is by a dam, which is deeper. And uh, the opposite, which was site four, which is taken not far from the inflow that you saw in the previous slide, which is quite shallow. And you can see the variation in total organic carbon illustrated through the depths of the sediment. Now, this is really important because a high level of total organic carbon, uh, pr uh, primarily at the surface of the sediment, is liable to fuel um, benthic microbial activity. Now, the benthic microbial activity in itself will use up the oxygen and decrease the, red uh, the redox um, um, uh, conditions. Now, when you have a decrease in redox conditions due to um, absence or decrease in oxygen, as Heather mentioned earlier, you're more likely to get phosphorus released from the water. So you're expecting to see decreased amount of phosphorus within the, the surface water um, at sites where you will get higher deposition of total organic carbon. Now, what you typically find is that you'll get low phosphorus in the surface waters and low organic carbon. And the reason is that they've, be, they've both been used up. Sorry, the organic carbon will have been used up. The phosphorus will also be used up, but also released during the process of benthic metabolic activity. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, the composition will vary across the sediment surface. It's not just bound to the actual layers, the depths that we have uh, within the sediment. So we have here, um, the sediment uh, layers on the right hand side. So we have layers one through to five for each site, and every layer represents uh, three centimeters 
further down. So we have 12 to 15 centimetres depth at layer five. Um, and the importance as well of not just considering the layers uh, of uh, analysis and the multiple sites of analysis and the frequency of sediment analysis, it's also important to consider ratios of the metals and the nutrients that you're actually measuring. So it's not just taking the number of how much uh, phosphorus is here, how much iron is here, how much calcium is here, how much manganese is here. With that data, when you put it together, so for example, I've got an example here of uh, using the iron, uh, the phosphate bound with iron versus the phosphate bound with calcium ratios. Now the ratio can give an indication of how likely the sediment is to actually release phosphorus uh, at that particular site, location, and or depth. And I reiterate that the depth is important because just because it's not the surface doesn't mean it's stuck at the bottom. It just means that if it is in a location like such as site three here and four, where you're more likely to get shallower water, then it is more likely that the deeper layers of sediment may become exposed. So it does matter what is actually in there. And more phosphorus is likely to be released under acidic conditions. Um, and the acidic conditions uh, where the iron to calcium bound P ratio is less than 0.5 within the sediment. Conversely, where the ratio is greater than 0.5, you're more likely to get the phosphorus released under alkaline conditions. So as you can see here, excuse me, sorry, as you can see here, the date of April 2016, the first column, the condition of the sediment within this particular reservoir, you were more likely to see the phosphorus released during um, acidic conditions. But as we move through the years, you have July 17, April 2018, and July 2018, the reservoir actually changed. The sediment actually became um, a different risk with regards to phosphorus release, and it changed in response to the change of conditions and the sediment fallout and the sediment exposure, where we found that there was a greater concentration of iron-bound phosphorus relative to calcium-bound phosphorus in the layers in the in the sediment. Consequently. This became a reservoir where the phosphorus is more likely to be released under alkaline conditions. So then we were able to adjust our monitoring and our reservoir management to take that into consideration. So this data, this information uh, from the data can actually highlight risks of uh, taste and northern events with regards to conditions that you're most likely to see them, so alkaline or acidic water. Um, the locations within the reservoir or the, or, the, or the lake, whether it's in the north, south, middle, west, east, or you, or wherever you select a sample. Um, and it's also important, like I said earlier, to have more than one sampling site. Um, and it also tells you um, whether, like, whether sand bacteria are actually likely to develop and, inc and increase the taste and order risk as a consequence of um, metabolite uh, production, uh, sorry, change in metabolic processes, we're most likely to get Josmin and 2MIP as a consequence of the change in metabolic uh, conditions, metabolic responses to the conditions. Uh, but that will actually tie in with ammonium concentrations and other ratios, such as total phosphorus with total nitrogen. Um, so I hope this has um, increased your, your awareness of how important it is to sediment to sample the sediment frequently, but also at different locations within the, the one site within the one reservoir or lake. And also don't forget to consider the deeper layers as well, because they can also, also give you a, a greater understanding of the risks with regards to um, disturbance. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Helen. Okay. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, I'll open the floor to, to any questions. Um, Alan, so you said you mentioned wildfire having a definite contribution to loading. Have you any experience of lakes where the continuous stocking of fish or angling has increased sediment loads and added to algal blooms? Um, yes, um, depending on the fish being stocked and the uh, bait, they can also contribute to nutrient loading in a reservoir. <clears throat> Thanks, Heather. Anyone else got have any other questions for our presenters this morning? You can come on. Um, you should be able to take yourself off mute if you want to ask, or you can type a, a question into the chat. What 
what, what's the, the biggest issue that we're dealing with in this in regard to this topic, Heather? Where where are the sort of real problems coming in, do you think? With... Um, I think with where where sediment is a problem, um the cost is often quite high to sort out um sediments if we're thinking of dredging large lakes and reservoirs there's obviously a significant cost associated with that and that's the reason these uh, te techniques such as the sediment capping have, have come into force um the the other problem with managing um nutrients in an online system is that often um sources in the catchment are outside the control of that asset owner so whether it be a water company um yeah that they don't control the catchment and it's quite hard for them to have any direct influence in the catchment um, through diffuse inputs, et cetera. Um, so they're often finding certainly with water companies that they can reduce um, nutrients to their reservoirs only by their direct contributions from, from discharges. Um, but they are looking and obviously trying to engage stakeholders um, people like Rivers Trusts into doing catchment work and funding catchment work with the overall aim of improving the water quality once it reaches their asset um, because improving it before it gets to the pipe is cheaper than improving it once it's in the pipe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, worked at the Broads Authority for a number of years in the UK um, and we undertook Quite a comprehensive program of sediment um, dredging or pumping um, but as you say it is expensive but it was incredibly successful not just for the lakes that we were pumping out in terms of reducing the phosphorus loading but also for the agricultural land onto which it was put um, it was closely monitored by um, an agricultural um, consultancy and they, they found very good nutrient and very low levels of any other um, concerning chemicals um, and certainly resulted in some good crops um, and yeah dealing with downstream issues where you, you're not the asset owner um, where the issues are coming from is always a problem I think there was a world war today topic recently um, entitled we all live downstream so <laughs> it's an ongoing issue um, you talked about the the, the, the capping so there's a number of questions there about FOSLOC um, have you any success with the like of FOSLOC were there any side effects of using FOSLOC? And do you know if FOSLOC has been used anywhere in Ireland? Um, so we've used FOSLOC, APEM have, have subcontracted the use of FOSLOC um, in a lock in Scotland. Um, and it did reduce, it was actually used as a combination of capping the sediment and to reduce um, algal blooms prior to the Commonwealth Games. Um, because what happened was as the, Foslock um, is added to the water. It settles out and takes all the algal cells with it and then caps them in, in the sediment. Um, so it worked with that regard and it did reduce um, phosphorus concentrations in the overlaying water. The problem with that site was it was an online system. Um, within a year, two years, uh, there was fresh um, phosphorus from a, a heavily urbanized catchment. Um, coming into the lake so uh, it wasn't successful in in that regard because there were fresh inputs still coming in to the the reservoir but there is there's a number of papers and a lot of work done on FOSLOC um, I don't know that it's been used in Ireland um, I do have contacts at FOSLOC I can pass I'm happy to pass on to anyone if you want to discuss with them um, in particular Okay, so um, Alan, we have your details. That's your question. So uh, we can we can have a look into that and come back to you. Yeah. What What about side effects, Heather? Do we know if there's any adverse side effects of using fossil? No, 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 nothing significant or nothing that can't be um, can't be managed. Okay, great. And then there's another question from Anna, who is um, wondering if the experiments on pea release from sediments for lakes can be transferred to sediments deposited in rivers and what experience do we have of um, riverine pea release? 
Yeah, so that's a good question. We've done it in, uh, today. We've only done it in still water bodies, um, but there this should be no reason why you can't do it in um, with river iron sediment. To so say it's done, it's done in the lab, so it'd just be a case of collecting the sediment and transferring it to the lab. I suspect in a river environment, there's less likely to be bottom water in oxia because it's more of a flowing system. But certainly no reason why any of this can't be done in a river. Yeah, so I guess the more sluggish and, and perhaps um, nutrient enriched the river is, the more likely the pea release might yeah. also occur. Especially in this in the warmer weather that we've been, been having. And if, you, if you're looking at it in a river as well, we, we've done a lot of work in canals with the sediment oxygen demand, for example. Um, and the thing to consider there is to look for where your flow, set, flow slows down and where sediment can settle out. Yeah. Um, and target your your sampling around those areas or get a broad range from fast flowing to slow flowing so you're capturing the full environment. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Some some nice ones there. Any uh, any other questions from any of our other attendees today? To so say you can either unmute yourself uh, or we'll pop them in the Q and A. Um, but there's one in the chat here. Has there been a study on how livestock and bank erosion can impact phosphorus? I'm sure there is thousands of papers out there. Um, we know it does. Phosphorus binds to sediment. Um, so it's a, it's a big part of catchment work to reduce nutrient concentrations is to look at buffer strips. Um, this, we recently reviewed some work done up in Scotland, which was um, looking at deer farms on the banks of some burns running down to a lock. And they found um, quite a lot of runoff from the deer farm into the, the burns that was then going to a drinking water reservoir. Um, and that was contributing, amongst other things, phosphorus, but it's quite high in dissolved organic carbon. Um, and also jasmine, um, the taste and odour compound was quite high coming from that. Um, but yeah, we've we've certainly done bracket sampling around areas of livestock poaching, and they're they're a significant source of sediment to the river, and hence anything in that sediment, sediment bound phosphorus, etc. So it's like a double whammy, really. There's the, the direct nutrient input from the livestock plus the poaching that causes sediment release into yeah. the course. Yeah. And of course, anything, the, anything on the, used on the land itself yeah. and fertilizers. And there's another question in the chat, Heather. Have you done any research into how sediment movement in lakes created by impounded rivers affects sediment transport into the downstream river system? For example, overtopping weirs. APEM has, not me directly. Yes, we've done um, some work up in Scotland on that. I can provide more information on that. Okay, that's a question from Harriet Alvis. So um, again, Harriet, we should have your contact details so we can uh, we can come back to you. So that's that's Alan and and Harriet that we we we'll, yeah. we'll go back to with emails. Any anything else? Um, no. Last chance. Okay. Great. Well, um, I'd like to say thanks very much to, to Heather and to Helen for their uh, fascinating presentation. Hope that you found it uh, both interesting and useful. Um, and um, I also need to tell you that we will be having another one of these uh, webinars. If I can just find the details. Um, and it will be uh, on um, there's the topic
Assessing the ecological impacts of abstractions and impoundments, lessons and challenges. And that's scheduled for October the 13th, uh, again at 10 a.m. And it will be delivered by my colleague, Associate Director Hannah Austin, who's a colleague of Heather's as well uh, in the UK. So yeah, Hannah will be talking about um, uh, an increasingly important issue here in Ireland of assessing the impacts of abstractions and impoundments. I know that that's something that we're having to get to grips with here as well. Um, so it will be advertised uh, to you all who've signed up to this meeting and also through our social media uh, channels. So if that's of interest to you or your colleagues, you can register already now. Uh, and as I say, it will be delivered on 13th of October um, at 10 a.m. So Sorry, that might be a good one to uh, follow on your question about impoundment. Um, that might be a good one to attend. Yeah. OK, great. So uh, we hope to uh, see you all again at another talk. Otherwise, I wish you uh, a good day uh, and good holidays if you haven't taken them yet uh, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, everybody. Speak Thank to you, you soon. Bye.